Are you filming already? Yeah, we're oh, filming. Look at that. Welcome to the dungeon. This is where the tornado comes through on a daily basis. It's funny though, because I'm like constantly battling with myself because I got into this to make art, not to make YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And I really want to stick to that. If it wasn't for short form, I probably would have quit. For me, finishing projects is the biggest goal. It's not even making the video. The funny thing is like every video that I do hurts equally as much as the last video <laughs> because I'm like pushing myself just like a little bit further. What, what you're saying is it's just the ultimate balance that you're always trying to strike with YouTube videos, right? JBV Creative brings together art and engineering through his mesmerizing kinetic sculptures. His videos capture the fascinating and intense experience of bringing these ideas to life in a way that is captivating to millions of viewers. When we met a few months ago, we immediately hit it off, and I thought he would be the perfect inaugural guest on this podcast. As part of Morley and Eden's grand adventure, I want to interview creatives across North America, in person, in the van, but for this episode, JBV's whimsical Toronto studio felt like a much more interesting setting than our unfinished van. We talk about how he pivoted from working at a toy company to creating his own inventions, the tensions between art, engineering, and content creation, the creative process, finding fulfillment, plans for the future. I think you're really gonna enjoy it. Who is JBV Creative? I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy who likes to make things. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> All right. End of show. <laughs> All right. Great. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> Who is JBV Creative? That's there's many different things. Um, but originally, I was someone who was working as an engineer with tons of ideas for like not commercial stuff that I wanted to make. And so at one point, I just decided I'm just gonna just do it. I'm just gonna like dive head first and try to like make all the things that I can't stop having ideas for. And mm -hmm. so that that's what's brought us here. I think when we first met in Toronto a few months ago, you were telling me you worked in the toy industry. That is true. Which seems like yeah. it would be a very good transfer of skills to like what you're doing now. Like almost identical actually. So that, that was the biggest thing. Like I had all these ideas, but I spent all my, all my time designing toys and basically it's the same thing. I just spent all my time on the computer in CAD, clicking, like twirling models. So at the end of the day, it was just like impossible for me to come home and try to do more of it. And so the only way, you know, was to take all the same skills and just direct it towards a slightly different outcome. Was there a period of time when you were working at the toy company and you had started making videos or was it like a clean break? It was sort of, there was like a transition, you know, like, like when COVID hit, I was now working at home. I had like a little bit more time. I had all of like the, the equipment that I was using. So I was getting better at just like, you know, like if I was printing something for like my own personal stuff, I could just put it on while I was working on something for the toy company. So there was like a little bit of time where there's like a transition, but it was just like, I was so burnt out from just spending all that time doing CAD that I just had to like, I just one day was just like, you know what, I'm doing it. You were so burnt out from all that time doing CAD that you were like, I'm gonna do CAD all the time. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I was doing CAD all the time already. And I was like, might as well just do CAD for the things that I wanna make that I think, I don't know. I mean, anyone who jumps into like creating has some sort of like, a self-confidence that may or may not be grounded in truth. Yeah. You know, or wh whatever you want to call it. So I thought like, you know, I can make cool things and I thought like, you know, you just make the stuff, you put it on the internet, everyone's gonna watch it, it's gonna be great. It's that easy. It's that easy, right? <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, at least I had the one part down that's kind of hard, you know, which is like making things is like, you know, there's 10, 15 years of experience learning how to make things. So now it's just been three years of learning how to make videos about how to make things. So you never done any video creation before that? A little bit, you know, but everyone thinks that video is easy, you know, <laughs> until you start trying to make it. I, I, I think everyone thinks that making things can be easy, you know, and then you start trying to think, like you just don't think about the details. Yeah. And I actually still run into that on every single project that I do. It's just like, oh, it'll be done in three days. And then three weeks later, I'm still like, wait, where, where does the bearing go? And you know, like, how am I gonna screw it? So it's just, I think it was the same thing with, with videos. Like, you know, like no one really talks about how hard it is to sit at a computer and just like go through hours of footage and like, you know, like the, the, the basics of it's really easy. You just splice, right. you know, and drop it into the timeline. But it's, it's just like the time and the, the thought and like the, it's like a puzzle, right? Absolutely. I think like a lot of art forms, it's like the motor skills there's only a few tools that you really need to use. And I find that yeah. especially if you watch like TV shows or movies, mm -hmm. especially things that are formed, like filmed realistically, 
they're not using a lot of effects or motion graphics and the takes probably are a lot longer than YouTube videos. Yeah. So there actually is less work in the edit. But it's, I think it's all about like where you use them, which comes from experience. And for me, like, yes. I feel very lucky that I feel like I started making videos in a very non-pressure situation. Like I started mm -hmm. making videos when I was in university as kind of like a hobby yeah. that I think I subconsciously wanted to turn into a career, but I didn't allow myself to think that until three years later. Yeah. So was, did you feel like pressure from the beginning of like, Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, from the get go, like it's, you know, like I said before, like I had the engineering skills, but, and so I didn't really think about the fact that the video would be like such a challenge to like learn. It's like, I didn't realize it was a full skill on, all on its own. Right. So while I'm trying to like fully output at full pop, I'm now trying to learn how to like envision how a video is going to go together. And like, I didn't even realize like storytelling was a thing and like, just like how to talk to camera and all of that. And like, so to, to have to learn all of that while trying to produce videos and you can actually see if you go back through like my YouTube, like history, it was like, I released a video and then three months later, another video. And then like six months later, another video. And like, I was constantly like, do I want to do this? You know, is this, is this what I signed up for? Mm -hmm. Cause I just wanted to make things, but it's, it's nice. Cause over time, like I've gotten better at making video and it's actually become more enjoyable. Like th that, like doing that part of it has become more enjoyable. So yeah. But I mean, for, as far as pressure, it's, it was, it was hard for a while, you know? And then short form happened and it got a little bit easier. Yeah. You know? I also like, I don't operate that well, like on long-term projects. And that's another skill that I'm actually like working on is like mm -hmm. picking something that's going to take a month or a month and a half or even six months to do is like, it's so scary, you know, especially if you're trying to get content out. And so it's kind of like a balance between, I don't know, like making content and making stuff that's like worth making. Right. Yeah, absolutely. The short form side of things I think is really interesting because I feel like people watching might know you from there because as far as I know, your shorts get like a lot of views and it seems yes. to have some ways kind of like propelled your channel. Definitely. I think if it wasn't for short form, I probably would have quit really? content a long time ago because yeah, because like YouTube videos, like it just like, you know, like when you spend like six weeks, like working day and night on a YouTube video and then it gets like 10,000 views. Yeah. It's like, why am I doing this? So like, just like the, the payoff just wasn't there. You yeah. Know? And now, now like short form, like you just get to iterate so much faster. You know, like my video skills got better so much faster because mm -hmm. I was releasing whatever, like even at one point, like a short a day. And so I just got faster, just like thinking through the entire process, thinking through like the whole video from start to finish. And now it's actually translated back into my long form video. It's way less overwhelming for me. Yeah. And just like the process of editing, like I just have it more down now. And that way, because of that, I'm allowed to, like I'm allowing myself to go back into focusing on long form just because it's a little bit more like financially, like, you know, like short form, you get tons of views, lots of subscribers, but it doesn't really make you any money. And right. I don't do this a hundred percent for the money, but these projects, you know, these big, prints cost money and so I need to I need to finance it somehow and so I think long form video is going to allow me to yeah do these bigger things that I've always wanted to do if tomorrow someone was like JBV we're going to pay you a fair salary for just making all this stuff but no more videos would you take that deal that's or tough, have you become attached to the videos I've I've become attached to the videos but I've more become attached to like I get to just choose and do whatever I want to do and I, and I've like, I really haven't like compromised that much on that. A couple of times I have to try to make like a YouTube video, but I've kind of decided like, like I didn't get in this to be a YouTuber. Mm -hmm. You know, I got in this because I, I have these ideas for the, these, I just want to make art and like engineered art. And like, I don't want to have any specific reason to do it more than just making the art. And so, yeah, I don't know. Like if, if that deal was like, you can still make whatever you want and not have to do any videos and you'll get paid like a decent salary. I, maybe I would take it. I don't yeah. know. I haven't decided yet. I personally get very annoyed by hypotheticals. So I don't even know yeah. how I would answer that question. I think that's, a, that's an interesting exercise though, to remember though, because it's like, why am I doing this? And there's definitely like motivation when you know people like, I think no one makes 
not many people, I can't speak for everyone, but I think when you make art, like part of what makes art art is like sharing it. Absolutely. And like having the world see it. Yeah. And with like short form video and YouTube, like I, I can reach so many people. Mm-hmm. More than I, you know, like it's kind of interesting. I, I had stuff in a gallery at the beginning of this year and, you know, maybe in the three weeks that it was in there, like what, like 500 people saw it? Which is like, it's cool to see it in real life. But then when you think about like, you know, like one of my shorts like hit like 16 million people and it's just such an unbelievable reach mm-hmm. that is so hard to compete with, you know, in yeah. any other form. So I think the video, the, I don't know, it it feels good to get views. Like yeah, any anyone who creates content would agree with that. But it also feels good for my art to just like be like making it out into the world. Absolutely. And, and so, I'm sure you get like messages from people saying how your work has benefited them in ways that you may not have anticipated. Definitely. And I think that's also cool. And like, I've always wanted to do something that can impact people positively. And so that helps as well. But there's definitely like, I'd be lying if I said there wasn't like a part of me that loved, you know, like when videos do really well. Oh, absolutely. You know? And so, and I, it's like kind of like against my beliefs, you know, to be like excited about that. A little bit. Yeah. And so I, it puts me a little bit at odds with myself and like my own values and whatever. But, you know. Well, it's tough, right? Because we're operating in this platform that has been engineered to tick your dopamine receptors. Yes. And to completely disassociate from that, I think, is a little unrealistic expectation of yourself. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, even with like negative comments, like I, I talked with Eden about this. You can ha- be as prepared as you want, but at the end of the day, like hu- humans have not evolved to deal with random like negative social interactions <laughs> yeah, from strangers. True. Like your body just doesn't really know how to process it. Yeah, they still they still bite, even if you know it's like if you know exactly like why and where it's coming from, and like that it's just some random person. It still sometimes bites. Yeah, you know. But it's funny. I've just sort of like with the negative comments, like I've kind of just like I'm at a point now where it's just like if I see one come in, I just like yell out loud oh. in real life like <laughs> like you know ex- expletive words and then i delete it and so at least i have the like i can respond to it without yeah. having to like i don't know like without like having to like defend myself to the internet which is like never it's never like a productive exercise right so yeah but i, I agree like no matter what like no matter what you know no matter how secure you are when people are shouting at you on the internet yeah especially work that you poured your heart and soul into and they're like, you know, like, why would you do it like that? Yeah. Idiot. <laughs> like, you know, it's like hard to be like, well, that just means my video is doing well. Like, it, you know, it just. It's really interesting how like you got into videos as a byproduct of making things. And uh, I feel like it is part of the reason why your videos are really good. Because I think people appreciate the amateurness of YouTube in a lot of ways. Yeah. Not saying your videos are amateurish. <laughs> they're but, pretty amateur. <laughs> but like they're, they're very natural in a way. Like I really like how you, at least with a lot of your recent videos, you tell stories like retrospectively. Like clearly yeah. the project is done and it was a success, but you kind of like go back in time and tell it and it makes it like very just pleasing to watch. Okay, Whereas I'm happy I, that you think that, yeah. Yeah, I think like, like you can get paralyzed with experience a lot of times. Like sometimes the more you do something, the more experience you have, the longer things take because you just start adding complexities for yourself. I mean, I, I've like many times been paralyzed by inexperience on the video front as well. Like it's funny, like my most recent video that I just released wasn't even gonna be a long form video. And then I was like editing the short form video and realized I already had like four minutes of footage. Yeah. And so last minute I was like, oh, I'll just make this into a long. So I didn't think about it at all. I just did it. And like got it done in like two days, which was like, and it's doing pretty well, right? It's one of my best performing videos so far. But I, you know, I think it's just it's like a lot of things have like added into that, you know. Like it's yeah. been now. It's like it's like I now do have three years of experience in making videos, and so it's kind of like you know, like when you think about I don't know, like I don't know what a good example is, but when you think about something you learned three years ago that kind of ingrained itself in your life Mm -hmm. and then you forget about the 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 part where you learned it and it just becomes like you know all these skills that you can draw upon so it's kind of like that now with making videos it's just getting easier but it's honestly still so hard it doesn't matter it doesn't matter like how much experience i have like yeah it doesn't matter how it always feels unnatural no matter what like every single video it's funny when i do a project like when i start an engineering project i can almost see it start to finish yeah right off the bat 
And is the like design, what is the really fun flow part for you? Is it the designing in CAD? Is it like tinkering with prototypes? <sighs> it's, um, I think when I, it's like assembly is the time where I'm in flow, you know, like in CAD sometimes it's a huge grind, you mm -hmm. know, because you're just making decision after decision after decision. And like decision fatigue is like a real thing. And after like, you know, like a couple hours of just having made little decisions, it just gets so tiring and like trying to figure out, oh, like how am I going to make this thing work over here? And like, it's just some days I have to just like walk away and come back the next day. And like, it's funny, like sometimes the things that I was like struggling with so much the day before I come back the next day and it's just like, oh, just like click, 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 done. But um, yeah, like when it's all the parts are like laid out on the table and I have to assemble it and it's like throw the music on and I'm just like vibing and just like hammering bearings and screwing, you know, like, yeah. And like you, you kind of know already that it's going to fit together the way that you envision. That's the part where it gets into flow, but it's like the, the, the part where you're like, I have this idea and you're super excited and now you're like, Oh no, I have to figure out how to like <laughs> make this thing. Yeah. You know, and you're like, I, I need to do this, but is that going to work? And it's going to take me like three days and I'm going to only know in three days if it's going to work or not. That's definitely not, that's not, not flow. There's no, there's no flow. <laughs> it's just like anxiety yeah. and discipline to like fight through that. I think, you know, which is another thing that I've learned over the last three years. Just, just got to fight through those, emotional dips mm -hmm. you know and, and they're not, i mean they're not like existen existential emotional dips they're just in the project you know in yeah your, like motivation but... and you get that with practice like that grit yeah. i think only comes with time yeah even with eden and i have been building out the van together and she doesn't have a lot of hands-on experience and we're, we're starting to come up on things that are difficult or don't turn out right yeah and it affects her a lot more emotionally than it does yeah. me just because oh, yeah. I've had that many times and she just hasn't. Yeah, 100%. There's yeah. a lot of reps that go into getting through that, which is, it's a, it's like another one of those things you wouldn't really, you don't think about, you know? You mentioned before we recorded that, like, for the first time you're working on a lot of projects at the same time. Yeah. Are you finding that that's helping your subconscious, like, figure out other projects while you're working on other things? Like, how is it that experience versus just hustling on one crazy machine at a time yeah i don't know i'm i'm still sort of like figuring that out like this this has only kind of come up because i'm printing these like big pieces that like you know like this thing that i'm working on is going to take like three weeks to print probably Whoa. so i just need to like get it dialed in so i can hit print and then i can go back and finish the other project so i'm kind of like i'm not working on two things like in parallel i'm sort of like working on one thing then pausing working on the next thing then pausing then work, you know um, but like overall I've, I've like sort of found like a little bit more like calm in the fact that I have stuff lined up, you know, I'm not scrambling to get something done so I can then start the next thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, it's kind of an evolution. I don't know. It's still early. I'll let you know. Yeah. I've, I find yeah. for me that like the biggest motivation I have is projects coming up that I'm really excited about. Yeah. Cause like you said, long form videos take a lot of time and that's the majority of what I work on is yeah. like making long form videos and there's always a chance that they're not going to perform very well. Mm -hmm. And that will affect you even if you try to create the success factors about the project separate and apart from the views. Yeah. Like if you're like, oh, this is great. I love this video. I'm going to make sure I have that in mind before I hit publish. Yeah. So that factors outside of my control don't like For ruin sure. me. But you can only do that so much. Yeah. And we all want to have very successful videos. We but do. I, I find that if I just have one or two things in a week, in a month that I'm like, that video is going to be awesome. That project is going to be awesome. It will like... It's something I can grab onto. Yeah. I mean, definitely like, like being excited of the outcome of your project is really important to, to get you through it. You know, mm -hmm. um, I think like, I don't know, for me, the videos are still, I think the projects are just so hard to finish Yeah, that the videos are still like, it's, it's still like, well, I got the project done. And like, that was enough for me. But know? honestly, like, again, that's, I think one of the things that's cool about your videos is the projects are so difficult that people are almost watching it as like, oh my God, he actually built this thing. Interesting. And that, yeah. that in of yeah. itself is like, you want to just see, you commu I think you communicate well, like the stress that went into it. Like when you show the CAD bender, yeah. things like that, where it's like, this was a lot. And you, it's clear that it was a lot because the finished piece is so complex. Yeah. Which honestly, like, I don't think a lot of people are doing on YouTube, one, because it's really hard, takes a lot of time, and it's difficult. 
I just said hard and difficult. Yeah. It's, hard, it's hard and difficult. It's hard and, and difficult. challenging. <laughs> but it, you know what I think, though? Like, th that's kind of a struggle with this stuff is, like, I spend so much time in CAD. And it's almost like you have to know, like, CAD to understand, like, why it's hard. You know? Like, it, it just doesn't seem like... It, I just don't feel like, like, videos that are just CAD are that interesting. Mm -hmm. I, like, I think, like, when you watch build videos on YouTube, a lot of the time it's, like, someone who's, like grabbing like cutting wood and like you know it's just like stuff that people have had a little bit more of their own personal experience with that allows them to like understand mm -hmm. you know that's why i'm like trying a couple scale projects to see if just the scale of something is more interesting than like you know like i spent a month designing this tiny toy yeah you know and like it's kind of hard to understand why that's it took a month you know well i think that's part of the reason why woodworking is like does really well on YouTube is because everyone, most people have some experience with woodworking. Yeah, yeah. Most people have taken shop class or like helped their parent cut a piece of wood, yeah, like shown the flashlight. For sure. <laughs> and even for me, like I'm not, I don't do any woodworking, but I watch woodworking videos because I can like imagine myself doing woodworking. <laughs> and I think that's, some, you know, like that's an important thing. It's like, I don't know, it's like some sports, for example, like, I don't know, like golf, for example, like people who watch golf play golf and like rarely do you find someone who who watches golf that doesn't play golf because you got you have to understand like why golf is so hard to un understand why the the professionals are so re so good at it yeah and I, I think that kind of translates forward in like cad work yeah i think we we agree <laughs> <laughs> no but it, it sounds like there is some like insecurity about your videos being interesting but do you not find that like like to me from the outside it, especially in the last few months, it seems like your videos are doing quite well, which shows that people are finding them interesting. Like, do you not, yeah, do you not I mean, feel validated by that? I'm starting to, but I'm still like trying to get the videos to perform better than like, none of my videos are performed over like 300,000 views. Yeah. And so but you can you build know, a very healthy channel on 300,000. You views. could, I mean, it's just more, I, I think I have underlying ambitions right. to be more than, you know, to, to do more than that and to, you know, and I, I'm, it's kind of like, it's actually, you know, it's it's like it's kind of interesting. You say like I started, I started with wanting to make art, and then video production became like you know like a part of that. But then like over time, I was just like, okay, like how what do I need to do to make a video perform better than you know like I want a video to hit a million. It's like it's like a goal that's kind of like right. arisen for me, arose. <laughs> but it's a goal that's come up, and um, so now I'm trying to think about like okay what. What do I need to do with my projects? It's funny though, because I'm like constantly battling with myself because I got into this to make art, not to make YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. And I really want to stick to that. You know, like I don't want to make stuff just for a video and then like, yeah, I don't know, put it in the shed. You know what I mean? Like, and so I'm trying to find ways to do both. But sometimes, you know, sometimes stuff is very just YouTube focused. Sometimes it's other focus that's becoming a YouTube video. And I, it's just, a, it's just like a constant, like, these things are at odds with each other. Yeah. And I think, like, I think you are more into creating art than I am, at least when it comes to the finished product. Like, I really like making videos, and I, I definitely feel that tension between, like, what I want to make versus what an audience wants. But I also yeah. find it, like, fascinating trying to, like, figure out what people want. Like, yeah. in some ways, it's, like, it is part of the process for me of, like, the the for me the realization of like why my first palette video did so well was like a fascinating process because yeah. i didn't realize it at the time there was this realization of oh it's free material and it's things that anyone can get so it's relatable mm -hmm. and i don't have like a professional workshop but i didn't like put all that together at the time yeah i think for me that whole story arising was like very fascinating it's true it's and, interesting and like i don't know growing up in school i wasn't like the most popular kid so i think in some ways trying to like find things that are popular not like i'm like chasing this like childhood like oh i want to be popular yeah. but there's something like really alluring about like oh what do people really like I, like i, I like the that. marketing you, part about like it. you always kind of did your own thing and now you're like trying to understand like you know what, what can stand out to yeah like the mass is more which i i wonder is the case for a lot of youtubers because i feel like to make videos and especially to make making videos you have to work by yourself a lot yeah and yeah. not to say I mean, that you're like you're like hunched in a basement and you we don't have any friends but like it's kind you know of, it's kind of actually like <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the most we're in a basement right now if you were, 
Yeah. It's not the most social hobby. No, it's like, definitely not a social hobby. You could spend like mm -hmm. or, a whole or life. Or a career like, or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Hopefully but, it's not a hobby. <laughs> <laughs> but like if we're talking about the before times, like yeah. when you're a child yeah. or when you're a teenager, like making videos and, or not even making videos, but just like tinkering with stuff. Yeah, for sure. I definitely like, this is reminiscent of like, you know, like when I just spent hours as a kid playing with Lego. Yeah. You know, or like building like connects roller coasters or whatever. Yeah, a lot of that is stuff that you do by yourself. And like, it is interesting because I feel like there are a lot of YouTubers who, who come from like this like do your own thing background who are now trying to create content for the masses. But hmm. also I think maybe like, if there's anything I've learned through YouTube is that the like niches are just, like you can have so many people in a niche and but they can be so removed from all the people around them. Like, you know, like, yeah, a niche, so, a niche is like amazingly powerful. Yeah. Like I think we were talking about the Rick Rubin book and that's one of the things he talks about is like paradoxically making things very personal can sometimes lead them to be the most successful, Yeah, and, which is yeah. something I need to like, I think accept a little more because yeah. I'm always, I always jump to like, well, what's interesting about this? Like, why would anyone care about this? But sometimes yeah. that's like putting the cart before the horse and you're like, maybe just because I find it fascinating, I should follow that at least a little bit. It, I mean, which is I, it's, it's not the same for you because you're spending hours and hours designing and there's a huge sunk cost. There, so I can yeah. imagine how you have a, a, some barriers around that. I mean, it's, it's funny because it's like what, what you're saying, is, it's just the ultimate balance that you're always trying to strike with YouTube videos, right? Because yeah. like you did, you've made some videos that have performed really well. And I've made some videos that have performed really bad. <laughs> but it's the videos that have performed really well, I think that are notable because those have opened up a lot of opportunities for you, right? Like you, you're on this TV show, like that was connected to your YouTube channel, right? Yeah. Yeah. In a way. In a way. Yeah. So I don't know. I, I mean, like, like as I make more videos, like I find... I don't know. I'm, I'm still somewhere in the middle. I don't, I don't have the answers right now. And I'm still very much like stuck wanting to follow my own passion. But it's also like I struggle to finish a project that isn't something that I'm like super excited to see it out in the world. And it's actually at, at the toy company. Like that was the biggest thing for me. It was like something that like, my boss and I talked about all the time was like when I was motivated to do something, I would just pump it out. And when it was like not something that I was that motivated about, it would just drag on for so long. Mm -hmm. So for me personally, like I kind of need, I need that excitement and interest and personal excitement and interest to get through the project. Absolutely. And that doesn't always translate to like really high performing YouTube videos. But again, like you said, if I could get 200,000 views on a video, for the rest of my videos or you know what even like over a hundred thousand like that you can build a, a pretty interesting career off of that alone mm -hmm. and also like i think what's cool is like my stuff can exist outside of youtube which i think is really exciting like this piece that i'm working on is going to exist at like new we've launched like the citywide art festival and so it's funny it's like i'm kind of at odds between that and youtube constantly just like oh but this is going to go exist in the real world but is this going to make a good video? Yeah. You know? And I'm like, yeah, I think back it, and forth, back and forth. It, I think it does provide for a bit of a safety net. If you're making videos about making physical stuff, you're like, I can always sell the thing I make yeah. or find fulfillment some other way. Definitely. Like I've been thinking about with the van and like maybe Eden and I want to build a house together one day. Mm -hmm. And maybe that won't even be like a video, but it comes directly from these skills that I've gotten from making videos. Whereas if I was had a gaming channel, I don't know that those skills would be as applicable to like taking things outside of content creation. Yeah, definitely. There's definitely more of a challenge to that. But I was also like, I'm kind of going on this like, you know, like any effort that you put towards hard things, you know, like building a van or even getting really good at it, like playing video games. Like I think that effort can be like, it's productive always, you know, and like mm. it will lead to things no matter what. Yeah. As long as you just kind of like stick with it and stay gritty. For me, finishing projects is the biggest goal. It's not even making the video. It's finishing the project and then finishing the video, but not making, you know, and, and I think for you, like finishing the van, making it look the way that you want. It's just taking a vision, which is just an idea and bringing it into the real world translates to so many different things. Yeah. What I mean, that again, bringing it back to the Rick Rubin book, that's like his definition of art and he doesn't He's like, and that is also the reason for making art. It's just about you have something you wanted to bring in the world. Yeah. You do it in some ways so that you can move on to the next thing. 100%. That's exactly what it is. 
And I, I reached my limit this year with concurrent projects. Okay. I had I, I realized that having four like big videos on the go at once, I just couldn't do. I kind of yeah. like shut down. Yeah. And I realized like, okay, I guess that's kind of the so limit. So what's your limit? Well, like you, I think what you were kind of trying to say earlier was that I think as independent YouTubers, content creators, you have to juggle a lot of things and you want to stay productive. So in a lot of ways, it's helpful having like projects at different stages because sometimes you're waiting for a 30 hour print yeah. and you can't do much it's else. True. So I think at a certain point, like you need to be working on multiple projects at a time. Yeah. Um, I think if I can have two in like different stages, um, I'm, I'm good because yeah. then I, I can like finish the video and kind of feather into the next one. Mm -hmm. Um, and then maybe like a third that's in a very early stage and I'm maybe just marinating. Um, but it, it kind of depends. Yeah. I think what's the worst or what was the worst for me this year was I had like three or four videos like in the edit and all of which involved like archival footage and more mm -hmm. footage that I had to take. Yeah. And I wasn't excited enough about some of them to like put in all that effort. Yeah. I get that. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's hard. I find it really hard even just to go back and open up an old CAD file. Yeah. <laughs> for some reason that there's like a lot of, I don't know, there's just something like, I don't know if it's just like hard for me to look at it or like, you know, and so it's it's been hard. Like these, these two projects that right now I'm working on concurrently, like one I started like two months ago. And so like every time I have to go back and open it, maybe it's because I got, I got kind of get like reoriented with like what's going on, you know, and I think that there's always like a challenge to just like, bringing yourself back up to speed, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, what if I forgot all this stuff? Like, what if I don't, you know, it's like, you have to like remember it all. And I think there's like effort that's required for that. And so it's actually funny, like this Rube Goldberg project that I've been working on, which I'm now like on a side quest and then I'm on a, the next video is another side quest. And so I'm like wondering if this is ever going to get done even. Yeah. And if it doesn't, like the goal is to produce ideas and make videos and then move on to the next one so maybe it will but it's just the further i go on these side quests the further away from the rube goldberg that i am that when i open it up again it's going to be like that same thing where i have to like reorient myself completely with that project yeah so it's getting like the further away i get the scarier it is to come back but it's kind of like there is kind of like three projects on the go right now one that's like in like finish mode one that's in like intermediate and one that's kind of like germinating so i, I yeah Definitely that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And it will also, I'm sure when it's all said and done, it, you will have learned so much about working on something at scale that like 10 years in the future, you'll look back and you'll be like, oh, that was just a little, yeah. a little easy thing that now allows me to do like much bigger things. A hundred percent. Yeah. It's all terrifying at first. <laughs> yeah. But it's also, I don't know, like now you're, you're working with Eden on, on these projects. Has it been easier to share like the burden of like thought with someone else? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that's, I think in some ways has slowed us down with the van build, but it's a good thing yeah. because I think every time that we actually then like cut a piece of wood or like put something in place, we've thought about it enough that like, we're like, okay, yeah, we're happy with that decision. We're not yeah. gonna have to go back and, uh, take it off, but it has an emotional toll. Like, I think this weekend we kind of reached our limit where like for five days straight, like we'd come home, we do wedding planning, we would design stuff for the van and we we're like, Oh my God, we need a day off. Yeah. And, and I mean, for our relationship, like we can't be like business partners yeah. all the way through. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, yeah. Especially with wedding planning as, as well. Like that's a whole project on its own. Yeah. As, as big as, as a van build, I think like, yeah, I think every once in a while when it feels like things are moving a little slow, I have like a fantasy of like, oh, if I were doing this by myself, I could do this, this, and this, it all moves so quickly. But then yeah. I like think back and I'm like, but so many of the, Number one, I love Eden and I'm happy that we're setting our life together, not to get it twisted, but just like being in a long-term relationship, every once in a while you fantasize about like being on your own and you, we all lived that life before you were in a relationship and you had like full control over your space, but all on balance, like doing it with someone else is far, far better. It's yeah. It's um, funny because I fantasize about like, I mean, this is unrelated to my personal relationship, but like working with people on all of this stuff. Like, yeah. But I get that at some point when I'm working with people on all this stuff, I'm going to be remembering the times when I was alone and didn't have to worry about that. Yeah, grass so, is always greener. Grass is always greener, exactly. So if but, you were to have like a person working for you tomorrow, what would they be doing? I mean, like video planning is kind of the, the area that I'm the weakest at. And the, it's the area that causes me the most stress. Because like while I'm like trying to work on my projects, I'm like, 
oh, like what, what if I'm not getting the right clips, mm -hmm. you know? And that, I'm always like a little bit concerned about that. So I think that would be like, like that and like the, like the edit and just like, just figuring out like this, you know, like the, just the packaging for YouTube thumbnails, titles, like all that stuff, which is like all my second thought mm -hmm. because I spend so much time thinking about the project itself. So that would be a big one. And then also just like any, someone who, who I can bounce like engineering ideas off of, you know, because sometimes just like when you hit a wall with something like, yeah, you can, you can go walk away, come back to it in a few days and like you might have some different ideas or you can just go like, you know, this is how it was at the toy company, go to like my coworker and be like, what do you think about this? And they'll be like, have you thought about this? Yeah. And you're like, oh my God, you just changed the game. It's, it's also like if you're relying on your gut for everything, which yeah. I'm a big proponent of, but it's hard to always know when you found the right decision. Yeah. You can be like, I think this is right. Yeah. But I'm only basing that off of like all my experience in the past. You don't have another mm -hmm. person to be like, yes, that's awesome. Let's do it. Yeah. It's actually so like, it was funny when I was at Open Sauce, which was like a the big maker festival and I brought something that I'd made and it broke at one point and some guy was just walking by and he was just like, why don't you just put a spring on that? And like, that should probably help. And I'm like, oh my God. Like yeah. here I am thinking like, it's doomed. It's not gonna work, it's over. And he was just like, why don't you just do that? And it was like, the exact fix that it needed. Yeah. And so sometimes you need that to just get you out of like, you know, like your laser focus on something. And I find with like videos, for example, if like I'm laser focused on the project, I'm not spending enough time like how to be creative on the video, you mm -hmm. know, or like how to tell this story better. And so sometimes like I find that that suffers a little bit. And like, I think it just like, I've accepted it just like, it's how it's gotta be right now because these projects take so much of my bandwidth. So yeah. it would be nice just to have like another mind. Do you bring your significant other into the process at all? Constantly, constantly. But you know, like she, she has a job, you know, mm -hmm. that she's thinking about. And you know, like she's got her things that she's interested in and her hobbies that like she's not spending time like solving problems for me while I'm, you know, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like her subconscious is not working on my problems. Yeah, but I find a lot of times that that knee-jerk reaction from other people is what I want. Yeah. Like I don't want them deep into it. I want them to be like, I'm gonna show you the four minutes of this video. What do yeah. you think? Definitely, and, and like, like she constantly will come in and just give me like little suggestions that like I wouldn't have thought about on my own. But like when I need help on like the engineering stuff, that's not, that's not her domain at all, yeah. you know? And like, even with like, with like video edits, like that's not something that she spends much time thinking about either. So I don't know. I think I need like someone who's a little bit more, you know, like, like this is their interest is what, like, cause like every YouTuber is interested in YouTube. I feel yeah. like it, it requires that, you know? And like the people who are in the industry are excited about it. Yeah. So I think that's part of what I'm looking for is someone who's like, who spends all their free time thinking about YouTube the same way I do. Yeah. And like, and engineering, engineering and YouTube, it's both, you know? Yeah. It's like, yeah. I think that's like probably like the hardest part about like maker YouTube is that like the videos themselves are a secondary to the project a lot of the time or they, they're in parallel, but the video and the project are equally important, you know, like, when it's like a challenge, for example, it's like the challenge is the video. And so how you structure the video is the challenge. You know what I mean? It's like all, yeah. maybe, you, maybe I'm wrong about that. I don't know, but. No, I think you're right. And like a video like this is an extremely different experience than editing a maker video. Yeah. And I don't know if you've ever tried it, but sometimes I've, I found like, wow, this is so easy. Like I editing a video. Yeah, I haven't tried it's it. It's a kind of a nice breath of fresh air in some ways. It doesn't make me want to make stuff any less. Yeah. Like I think I'm going through this the past like six months or so has been a very interesting growing and like figuring stuff out phase for me where I'm trying to figure out like what, what is really fulfilling for me in all of this? Yeah. Do I identify more with like a video creator or like a maker? Um, and for some <laughs> ways funny, I have like yeah. imposter syndrome in both. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. And I think like I've, I've gone like a little one way and a little one, the other way. And I'm finding that for one, like I really enjoy woodworking um, but if I go all the way towards woodworking, I do miss some things about 3d printing and the more engineering side of things yeah. like that, it, like that engineering education wasn't just like, Oh, I studied civil engineering, but I didn't become a civil engineer. Like yeah. a lot of parts of my identity and fulfillment Definitely. are still wrapped yeah, up in that. Sure. And like, you know, you have the whiteboard with like, it looks like bo a more circle, <laughs> some mathematical <laughs> yeah. equations. Yeah. Um, uh, like even if you're not working in the field, like, you know, there's a reason you got into it. 
Yeah, I mean, like all engineers, at least in the five years where you're like, you have no choice but to be obsessed with engineering. Like all the people I went to school with, like definitely identified as engineers yeah. in school. You got you got the iron ring. Got the iron ring. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I personally definitely identify as an engineer. It's like everything that I do and the way I think, and like it's just it's a huge part of who I am. So I get that. Like it's hard. I've I've actually moved away from engineering a couple times and come back to it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, but I I hear what you're saying. Like it's it's hard. I I think part of it is like just the struggle of doing both. Sometimes it makes you, you know, like when you're doing videos, you're like, do I even really want to do woodworking? Mm -hmm. You know, and when you're doing woodworking, you're like, do I want to make videos? Like, what do I like more? Well, you this know, is... like what, what fulfills me more? Everything comes with its challenges. Like yeah. for me, sometimes I'm like down here, I'm like, do I even like engineering? <laughs> you know, because it's just so hard in the moment. But I do always end up like, you know, when I'm not feverishly doing CAD like definitely like this is what I love so when you're not feverishly doing CAD you're dreaming about feverishly doing yeah CAD. exactly <laughs> yeah you know like when I'm having ideas it's always for these things and the only way to get these things is to, to engineer them and mm -hmm. so I don't know if it's the engineering I love or if it's the, the the creation of these like engineered things but it all comes hand in hand I mean like like nothing nothing that you like nothing worth doing was ever easy to do really. yeah you know, even if you like really love like sport, like a, a sport, for example, it's like the training is always going to be hard. And so I think it's just, it's all what comes with the territory here. Yeah, absolutely. It's fine. I've, I've seen, you know, like there, there's been people who are like trying to start YouTube channels and then they end up creating like how to start a YouTube channel channel, yeah. you know, and it's interesting. Like, I feel like that's, it sometimes feels easier to like talk about how to start a channel and to just do the thing itself, you know? Yeah. And like, it's like you were saying, like maybe like talking about creating maker YouTube videos, it's easier to edit those videos than it is to actually do it yourself. Yeah, absolutely. But I think for one, like the conversation has to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think to have interesting conversations, a lot of times you need to be in it. You need yeah. to be like in the industry. Like people Definitely. don't want to hear about like some random pundit or not yeah. even a pundit, but just like, you know, you want those experiences to have good conversations and I don't want to do this for all of my videos. Like this yeah. thing is, this, these are great and I get a lot of the, these conversations. Yeah. Um, but it's all like part of this larger creative body of work. Like I was thinking about on my drive here, um, you think about people like Andy Warhol who had like so many creative outputs. He made mm -hmm. like paintings, he made films. Maybe I'm mixing him up with other people, but a lot of like creatives, you know, they had a lot of different things that they did yeah. and they, they didn't really like let those define them. I think people become very wrapped up in labels as well sometimes. Definitely. And your audience, um, your audience can be amazing and your audience can be also very quick to put you into a niche. Like I found it with the, the van pivot. Like a lot of people are upset that we're doing this yeah, and they're like, I didn't, I didn't get into this channel to watch you do this, which is like, fine, like then leave. Yeah. You can unsubscribe. Like, yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm sad true. to see people stop watching, but like, um, it's all part of like a larger thing. And mm -hmm. I, I think one of the comments that stuck with me the most when we made this transition was um, someone said like, this is really cool. I'm not super into van life, but I could sort of feel your videos starting to get a little stale. So I think this is like a really good decision that you're making. Interesting. And I was like, I could feel that as well. Like when I made my, one of my latest trash to treasure videos, I showed it to Eden. Like when, when we, I always show her like my, my finished videos before I publish them. Yeah. Sometimes I don't if I'm really excited about it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, it's up, watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but usually I do. And she was like, I think this is a great video. I also think I've watched this video before. Yeah. And I was like, I think you're absolutely right. Um, yeah. And, and it was the yeah. right time to. Like, I definitely, I worry changes. about that actually, you know, because at some point, like my videos are going to, I had this idea to make a thing and then I made the thing, you know, and it's just like, definitely at some point I like worry about what's going to happen when that gets stale. But it's also like for you, like, is it getting stale for you and that's why you pivoted or is it just like, this is just another thing you want to do? I think, um, it was Eden's original idea. And I think if she hadn't come to me with it, I don't know if I would be doing van life now. Okay. But once she presented the idea and I like got excited about it, it was then something I wanted to do. Yeah. But I think at the same time, like I go through a lot of phases with things that I like doing and it was, mm -hmm. it sort of the stars aligned and it was time to sort of move on to the next thing. And it's going to open up a lot more opportunities For that sure. has inevitable growing pains yeah. as, and I think a lot of times when you go to make a change, you don't think about the growing pains. And then afterwards you're like, oh yeah, 
most times when you have something that's working and you change, it doesn't work right off the bat. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. that's okay. For sure. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, um, I think, honestly, there's so much variety in what you do already that like, I don't see two of your videos as like, oh, he's just doing the same thing again. They're all so yeah. different already. I mean, at some point, unless I keep like, the funny thing is like every video that I do hurts equally as much as the last video <laughs> because I'm like pushing myself just like a little bit further on each video. So hopefully like I can keep pushing myself and like, the, you know, things can grow in scale, but in like complexity, whatever it is. Yeah. But um, I just worry at some point, you know, it's going to, I'm going to run out or at some point for myself, I'm going to run out of like excitement for what I'm doing. Well, maybe that's the time then to bring on someone else. Maybe it is. Or maybe that's the time where I, I just have to pivot and that's just the way it is. Yeah. It's like um, my friend, my friend Wabi Sabi, I don't know if you've seen his channel. He did like a big farmhouse restoration, all these incredible videos of restoring this farmhouse. And then at some point he, he like, like we were just talking, he's got so many things that he wants to do that he stopped making farmhouse videos. Now he's like on to something else. And I think maybe it's just inevitable at some point, you know, like it happens. Maybe that's just the, the YouTube cycle. That's where like new people come in, mm -hmm. you know, or I don't know, like just life has a way of bringing you like in different directions that sometimes you've never even seen. So absolutely. Who knows where this is going to go? Yeah. I mean, most bands don't last for 60 years. The Rolling yeah. Stones are a bit of an exception. <laughs> yeah. But like, I mean, now are they making, they're not making new music. Now. No, I think they came out with a new, I was listening to CBC. They came out with a oh, new really? album. Uh, Crazy. Crazy. <laughs> a little while ago, but that's the exception, right? Was like, it more of the same or was it different? I don't know. I haven't listened. Oh, you haven't listened? <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean like it's rare. YouTube's still very young. You know, yeah. we don't know how far this is all going to go. Yeah. Like the old, the, the oldest a channel could possibly be is what? Uh, not even 20 years. Not like, even, no. 10 years. 18, 15, 18 yeah, something like that. What, what year is this, 2023? When did yeah. it start? I think like 2006. 2006? Yeah. yeah. So we're, I mean, like, Smosh is having their whole revitalization. I don't even know Smosh. You know Smosh? No. Smosh no. is uh, one of the OG YouTubers. They made these, like, comedy sketches. Gr eventually grew it to, like, I'm going to misspeak and people will tell me in the comments, but almost grew it to, like, a media company. Some drama happened with a business thing, and then they kind of got their channel back, and now yeah. they're making videos again. Interesting. Um, but, yeah, I don't know. Like... Yeah. Again, that's, I think, an important reason not to get too focused on labels. Like, I like calling myself a YouTuber. I think once my channel started growing a lot, I felt comfortable doing that. Mm -hmm. And I identified it with as well. I was like, this is really exciting. Like, I yeah. am a YouTuber. Yeah. Let's talk about it. It was a fun thing to talk about at parties. Yeah. I, but yeah. if you become too wrapped up on that and then YouTube stops working, well, maybe your yeah. identity isn't a YouTuber. Maybe it's Definitely. a creative or a yeah. video I mean, creator. yeah. I guess when I think about my identity, it's more like an engineering artist, but I, I don't say that out loud because it's just like too hard to explain. Right? Yeah. So easy now. It's funny nowadays when you t tell people you're a content creator, no one really like questions it, you know? Yeah. Um, I get a lot of people who are like, oh, really? Like I've heard people do that, but I've never met someone who actually yeah. does it. How does it yeah. work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, definitely you get that now too, but I think it's just more, it's like such a, a like, it's funny. I was having a conversation with someone like five years ago, even they were talking about how their kid, when he grew up, wanted to be a YouTuber. And we were just like, that's insane. You know, <laughs> kids these days, you know, and it's like funny, like here I am now. It's just like, okay, like things have changed, you know? Yeah. All of a sudden you're living in the future. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> and you're surrounded by eight 3D printers. A lot of 3D printers. Yeah. All right. I think that might be a good place to end it. For sure. Uh, thanks for doing this, man. Of course. Yeah. This is great. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed it.